Hi, my name is Purna Bell. I'm an author and journalist, and I'm going to talk to you about resilience. So I'm going to start this off by asking you to think about what resilience means to you. Don't overthink it, just whatever pops into your head. Whenever someone asks me this question without even thinking about it, the first thing that comes to mind is that resilience is someone who just gets on with it in the face of adversity or a challenge. They can work long hours, go without sleep, they don't complain, they don't say anything, they just keep going. Now, the reason I think that's where my mind immediately goes is because that's what's been hardwired into me. But that isn't what resilience is at all. And that kind of mindset, that's quite hard to shift. Resilience isn't about pushing through no matter what, no matter how you might feel or how stressed out you are. Resilience isn't about how much you can get done without needing to ask for help. And resilience definitely isn't something that you're born with. The definition that I find best describes what resilience actually is, is from a developmental psychologist called Frank Inferna, who said, Resilience is defined as exhibiting a relatively stable, healthy trajectory of change following adversity. In other words, it's not just how quickly you bounce back, but it's how you bounce back. And it's looking at the adversity that you've experienced, adapting to it, learning. It's about when things are stressful, how you handle those situations in a way that's healthy, that's protective and nurturing of yourself rather than thinking you just need to power on through no matter what the cost is to your mental and your physical health. It can also be pretty individual. You know, I could give you five top tips around resilience, but it's going to be worthless. It's not really going to be much use unless it's something that you can apply to your life in a way that's right for you, because we experience things differently depending on lots of different things from race to class to gender to sexual orientation. We're in the midst of a racial justice revolution right now, which shows how vastly different our experiences can be. And we're also in the midst of a pandemic. And one of the most powerful things to come out of that is to highlight the many, many ways a singular event can have so many different outcomes and experiences for people. My goal here is to show you what I've learned about resilience, but also maybe to get you thinking about what that looks like for you and maybe just do a little stock take of whether your life is actually set up in a way that supports you being resilient. I learned about the true meaning of resilience the hard way. It's always the hard way and realized that what I thought it was wasn't what I thought it was. So what did I think resilience was? I'm British, I'm South Asian, something that's quite common, but not exclusive to having immigrant parents, is thinking that resilience is literally about surviving in whatever way you need to make that happen. And that might be getting a job and holding on to that job, no matter how awful it might be. And that might be putting on a brave front to keep up appearances. So that could be, you know, going to a social occasion, whether it's like work or your personal life and something absolutely terrible may have happened to you but you put on a brave front. I have amazing parents. I don't really want to throw them under a bus because above anything else, their top line is always that they want me to be happy. But there was a lot that I absorbed around the idea of resilience, that you just get on with things, that you do things for people even to your discomfort. And if you're a woman, that's magnified tenfold because you're taught to put other people's needs before your own as part of your social conditioning. When I graduated, I went straight into journalism and it is a brutal industry. Um, there are long hours, you know, massive booze culture, really demanding bosses. And sure, a lot of other industries are like that, but journalism is probably one of the worst paid. So if you do it, you do it for the love of it. And you don't really think about whether your industry is sustainable or something that cares about you or makes you happy. And the first two journalism jobs taught me that long hours were just normal. Even if you finished your work, you still had to stay behind because if you left actually on time, it was a bit of a cop out. You know, it, even if your workload was really, really high, you just didn't complain about it because the, the complainers didn't get good assignments. They didn't get promoted. They got made fun of. And the people who had the least amount of sleep, who drank the most, who worked the longest hours, you know, like in a horror movie when someone's kind of trapped in a cupboard for weeks and they just come out looking really unhealthy, that was those people and they were given godlike status. 
By the end of about five years of this, I was unhealthy, unhappy, burned out. So I quit and I went freelance to try and instill some sense of order into my life. It was really healing. It taught me a lot about what I wanted my work environment to be like but there was still this nagging voice like, you know, I should have just kept going. Maybe I wasn't hard enough. Maybe I couldn't hack it. And around a year into being freelance, I would say, I met the most incredible person, a man named Rob, who I would eventually marry. And fairly early on in our relationship, Rob told me that he was prone to depression. But this was back in 2009 when the mental health conversation wasn't particularly around much. And I didn't really know what depression would be. So I just didn't think it was really going to be that much of a problem. Rob's depression, however, in the first year of us getting married, seemed to be getting significantly worse. He was in bed a lot, had insomnia, didn't seem like himself but there was a lot of love and laughter in our relationship. So I just kept going. And I kept thinking that he'd get better and it would pass. And we didn't really tell people outside of our home about what was going on, because again, this was a time when there was a huge stigma around depression and we just wanted people to think we were a normal couple. Now, shortly after this, the first major thing to go wrong in my life went wrong. And I realized how lucky I am to say that, that at the age of 31, that's the first thing that had gone wrong. I'd been feeling out of breath and I eventually went to hospital where they diagnosed me with a hole in the heart. And apparently I'd had it since birth, but my body had just managed to carry on as normal until it reached the point where it just couldn't cope anymore. I was lucky. I had really straightforward keyhole surgery. After the, the initial few weeks, I made a really fast recovery. But although physically I was better, mentally it took a lot longer. I was grappling with the idea of my mortality, something I'd never really have to even think about before. And there was also this sense of anxiety that I'd never felt before. It felt like I'd taken so much for granted when in actuality, anything could happen. The way I started to make my peace with it was that yes, it had been a challenging time, but I learned to appreciate my body for all that it had done so far. And I also started to look after it a bit better and I wasn't so unkind towards it. And unknowingly, this was actually a part of building resilience. Kind of three steps, if you will think of it that way. The first is realizing your life is worth something and that you're valued and loved. The second is recognizing that this is about survival. And the third is that preventative measures are always better than reacting to a crisis. But at the same time, it wasn't as if Rob's issues had gone away. It, in fact, actually, he seemed to get worse and it seemed like he was actually keeping something from me. And when I eventually confronted him and gave him an ultimatum about telling me the truth, he told me that in addition to having depression, he'd also been battling a secret addiction for three years and not just any addiction, an addiction to heroin. Now, I had no frame of reference to help guide me through this. There were no top tips in a magazine that was gonna help, that was gonna give me some idea of how to survive it. So I did the only thing I knew, which was to help him, to present some semblance of normality to the outside world, and to just keep going. And at the same time, I'd also been promoted to the most senior role of my career, which was executive editor for HuffPost. So, there was zero give, there was zero flexibility in any part of my life. And when I look back, I genuinely don't know how I did it. I think in my head, I thought I was doing a really good job of trying to just keep everything afloat. But when I look back at pictures of myself from that time, um, what I thought was resilience, I actually just look like I'm kind of crumbling on the inside, like someone who's barely keeping it together. And the one thing I did do, which I think saved me, to be honest, was joining a support group, which was a place that I could get advice, not feel judged. And I think it was the first time I'd ever gotten outside help for what was going on in my personal life. Now, around 18 months after Rob confessed to being an addict, the unthinkable happened. While we were on a trial separation in 2015, and he was staying with family in New Zealand, he took his own life. And his death remains the most single major event and trauma I have ever experienced in my life. It was devastating, it was incredibly sad, and it was life altering. And those are some heavy emotions, right? And I don't really wanna dwell in that space for too long. So I'm gonna focus on why it was life altering. I flew out to New Zealand for the funeral. And when I came back to work, it was about three weeks later, which is actually pretty quick. You know, some people take months, 
some people actually never go back to their jobs. And there's no, there's no right or wrong way, by the way. You know, you don't win at trauma if you come back earlier. But to describe what being in that kind of grief is like is, it's like having a thousand different emotions all at the same time. And it's like carrying, you know, this sort of bottomless pit with you, but at the same time, you're expected to breathe and eat and just have conversations with people and do your work. And what I realized very quickly was that it had been completely unsustainable the way I had been trying to handle life when Rob was alive. And more than that, I could not do it anymore. I could not live that way anymore. Death strips away a lot of the artifice, a lot of the lies that we tell ourselves about things that we think matter. And what you learn pretty quickly is that the opinions of other people do not matter as much as we think it does. I'd invested so much time just doing things, saying things to please other people, you know, that whole keeping up appearances. And it didn't really matter, you know, if I stayed at social events later or if I had too many things in my calendar. It was my life and I had to manage it in a way that was right for me. And yes, that also included not overproducing work so my boss would think I was doing a good job even though I already had way too much on my plate. Almost immediately, I realized how precious a resource my time and energy was because grief does not give you any extra space to play with. And if you try and fool your mind and your body by pushing, 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 it will pull an emergency handbrake and it will stop you from doing anything, whether that's physically not being able to leave my flat or you know, just not actually being able to converse with people. So I learned to respect my time. I learned that mentally I really needed space between seeing people, being busy, you know, just working. And I also realized that I hadn't loved or looked after myself very much in the last few years because everything had been about Rob. Everything had been wrapped up in him. And that meant that I had to take a long, hard look at my life. And I had to look at my routines in the morning and evening, do an inventory of how much sleep I got, like how nourished I was, how much I moved my body. And it also meant that I had to look at my relationships with people. You know, not every relationship made it. I had to take a hard look at the people in my life and ask whether we were actually good for each other. Was the relationship toxic? But also I had to learn to ask the people in my life for help, which was something I'd always been bad at doing. And in doing so, I learned that it wasn't a weakness, but it was a strength. And I realized that my whole life, I'd always used mental health strategies or coping measures when things were bad, you know, when I'd really hit the wall, rather than doing them consistently, daily, to create a, a solid foundation. And doing them consistently meant that I actually created that space to check and see whether my mental health might be getting bad. I mean, I had support, I had therapy, CBT, did daily breathing, and all of that helped me to see things off in the distance before it got bad. And so slowly I started to build up my resilience, not because I just carried on and pretended like things were normal, but because I took my grief head on, did the work to create that healing. And I always, always had that picture in my mind of where I wanted to get to in life and what that would feel like. Building resilience is an ongoing thing. Um, people said to me at that time, at least it can't get any worse. And I just thought, well, yes and no. The worst thing that I could have imagined had happened Rob was no longer here. But no one knows that they've experienced the worst thing of their life until it happens. And there's no quota or limit on what you might experience. Now, that might sound super scary, and it might make you not want to ever leave home. Obviously, in non-pandemic times, this would mean something very different. But I think it can actually be really freeing. Because if you can't control everything, then all you can do is make yourself strong, resilient. So whatever life throws at you, you can handle it, cope with it, deal with it, fall down, and then get back up again. Some signs that you might have low resilience could be getting angry, constantly becoming ill, increasingly being dependent on friends or family, maybe isolating yourself, experiencing mood swings. All of these things, by the way, are very similar to what burnout might look like, you know, like overreacting. Um, massively about things. Now, as much as I said I wasn't going to give you five top tips, I'm going to give you five top tips because everyone likes a tip, which is a roadmap to actually building your own resilience plan. 
And if you think of resilience as a bank account, it's wealthy and it's thriving as long as you're regularly paying into it. The first is recognizing and drawing on our, on our strengths. So have a think about you know, a difficult situation or a time in your life that you overcame, that you got through and write it down. This is so important because it makes us understand our abilities and our achievements. The second is the ability to process failure. If you keep charging ahead and not looking at what went wrong, you can't learn from the failure. And the failure is what helps you to get it right the next time. And the third is regulating our emotions. So when you feel like things are going from naught to 60, what is it that helps you in that short term to give you a calm head? Like mine is going for a walk or breathing using a mindfulness app or screaming into a pillow, seriously. And the fourth is drawing on our support network. So that means asking for help. I mean, I have two friends that I know I can call. I don't call them all the time, but I just know that they're there. And the fifth is taking charge and looking forward. And that's looking at what you can change and what you can't. And taking the thing that you can change and actually having the ability to make those changes in your life. None of us can ever plan what will happen in life, but we can have some element of control over how we handle it when it does happen. And that's something that only gets stronger and more resilient with time.